Welcome back everybody, this is the video for section 14.2, which is all about, uh, still about chi-squared, but it's our book calls it uh, Inference for Two-Way Tables. Just to kind of give you a, a little roadmap where we are, in section 14.1 we learned about the first flavor of chi-squared, which is the chi-squared goodness of fit test. In this section, 14.2, we're going to learn about the other two remaining flavors of chi-squared. The first is called the chi-squared test of independence, and the next one is called the chi-squared test of homogeneity. Homogeneity is kind of a crazy word, but think about it, it's the noun form of the word homogeneous. Um, so homogeneous means, you know, the adjective meaning all the same. Homogeneity is just the noun version of, you know, all the sameness. So we're going to learn about these two types of tests, chi-squared tests. Still same formula, it's still going to be a lot of chi-squared stuff, but just a little bit different. So the first thing is, we have to figure out when do you use the chi-squared test of independence and when do you use the chi-squared test of homogeneity. This is exactly from our book, and they kind of, this explains how you do the difference, how you decide whether it's independence or homogeneity. So just reading it, it says, you can distinguish between the two types of chi-squared tests for two-way tables by examining the design of the study. Design of the study means go back, way back in your uh, AP Stat notes to uh, Chapter 5 when we talked about sampling designs. In the test of association independence, I'm going to use independence rather than association, there's a single sample from a single population. And the individuals are classified into according to two categorical variables. For the test of homogeneity, there's a sample from each of two populations. Each individual is classified based on a single categorical variable. The precise statement of the hypotheses differs depending on the sampling design. I don't think that's that helpful, though it does give you a little bit of an understanding that, first of all, these two tests are exactly the same in terms of steps two, three, and four of the inference toolbox, and all that's going to differ is your ho and your ha. But the big thing that comes out of this is it comes down to your sampling design. What did they actually do to take a sample? Okay, And let's look at an example to help us decide which one's which. Okay, So here's two examples. I'll let you pause the YouTube video and just read them. Okay, hopefully you've read them now. So the question is, which one is independence and which one is homogeneity? And here's kind of the key difference. I want you to think about the row totals and the column totals. Are the row totals and column totals accidents, or are they kind of by the design of the study? For example, you notice that these two numbers right here, this, this column total, right, adds up to 200, I can't even add, 224, right? Okay. Was that an accident? Would they have known that ahead of time, or is that just kind of a random, you know, random chance? Hi. 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 Um, in this case, it was just random chance. They didn't know ahead of time that they were going to find 224 people between the ages of 18 to 29. Similarly, think about if you add up these numbers, okay? Now, whatever they add up to, is that going to be by accident, or is that kind of by design? The answer is by accident, right? They didn't know that ahead of time they were going to get whatever number this is, number of people who said four, okay? If the row totals and the column totals are both accidents, meaning they would not have known that ahead of time, then it's a test of independence, okay? Compare that to the example down below. Look at this row total right here. It adds up to 120. Is that an accident, or they have known that ahead of time? Well, it's not an accident. You notice they said he samples 120 people in each of the regions, okay? So would he have known that actually, for example, the south region is going to add up to 120 before he started asking people? Well, yes, because he actually asked 120 people. In this case, the row total, or sorry, the column totals are not by accident, which means it's a test of homogeneity, Okay. If the row, if either the row or column totals, if sorry, if both the row and column totals are accidents, it's independence. If uh, they are, would have been known ahead of time, it's homogeneity. And that's basically what I just sum up here. If the row totals and the column totals are an accident, meaning you would not have known before you started doing the survey, experiment, sample, asking people, then you should use a chi-square test of independence. This word says independence, but I ran out of room. If either the row totals or the column totals would be known beforehand, meaning you knew you were asking that many people, then you should use a test of homogeneity. This is it's kind of saying the same thing our book says, although I think it's a little bit easier to understand it this way. And notice it comes down to your sampling design. How, what, did you, what did you actually do? 
Okay, but again, don't kind of think about this too much because the only real difference is what you write down in your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. Steps two, three, and four are basically the same. Okay, two more quick formulas for this before we do our examples. The first is we have to think about our expected counts. And it turns out the formula you're going to see for expected counts is row total times column total divided by table total. And you'll see that in, in a second. The second new formula is we have a new formula for degrees of freedom for these two tests. Um, by the way, these are the formulas both for tests of independence and homogeneity. Because um, we no longer have an N, right? We have a table. So degrees of freedom here is rows minus one times columns minus one. You'll see me just use these two formulas in the pr next two examples. Okay, so here's the first example. Okay, it's the same example on the previous page where notice the row totals and column totals are accidents. So I'm going to use a test of uh, chi-squared test of independence. My, nu my null hypothesis, age and opinion, are independent. And my alternative hypothesis is age and opinion are not independent. Again, the only difference between chi-squared test of independence and homogeneity is what you write on this step one. Okay? You could have also written age and opinion are not related. It's kind of saying the same thing as they're independent, aren't they? There's this and this are kind of the same thing. And then age and opinion are not independent. I guess you could say age and opinion are related. Now, I know a lot of you are saying, well, geez, it's really easy to figure out its independence because, hey, look, it uses the word independence in the question. That won't always be the case. Sometimes they'll use phrase like test whether age and opinion are related in some way or something like that. So don't, if it says the word independence, that's a nice clue, but that word won't always be there. Okay? So now here, okay, we'll assume that this sample is an SRS. That's kind of our first check. The harder thing, though, is is the chi-squared test appropriate? And here's where we have to start using our new formula. Remember, our rule is all the expected counts have to be greater than 5. Well, the big question is, well, what do we expect for our expected counts? In other words, look at this number, 172, right here. We observed that 172 people between the ages of 18 to 29 were for it. How many would we expect? Well, here's where we use our new formula, row total times column total over table total. The numbers in red are the column totals and the row totals, and the table total adds up to 1,017. So to calculate how many I would expect, I would say the row total, which is 743, see I wrote that there, times the column total, which is 224, over the table total. Again, row total times column total over table total. That gets me how many I would expect for this particular cell of the table, which ends up being 163.65. I would have to do that for every single cell in the table, so I'd have to do a calculation like this six times. I did it one more time. We observed 313 people between the ages of 30 to 49 were for it. How many would you expect? Well, I did row total is 743, column total is 416, over table total is 1017, and that would be the number I would expect, which is 303.92. I'm going to stop there, but notice you have to do that four more times. Hint, hint, your calculator can do it for you. You notice that the number's down here. And so I'll say, okay, the chi-squared um, distribution's appropriate because uh, all your expected counts are bigger than 5. And just to show I did, I said, look, the smallest one's about 60.35. Okay? So your conditions are something like this. Okay? And now I do the chi-squared formula. Here, I have to do it for each cell in the table. So it's a 2 by 3 table. I've got to do it 6 times. So observe, I'm a, oh, I left out a sigma. Oh no, I left out a sigma. Here it is, ready? Sigma. Good, okay. Uh, so observed minus expected squared over expected. My observed is 172. My expected is 163.65 squared over 163.65 plus observed is 313 minus expected 303.92 squared over that. I would have, again, have to do it six times and I get a chi-squared value of 6.68. Look, here's my new degrees of freedom formula. Rows minus 1 times columns minus 1, uh, and then I get 2. Now, actually, just to be clear, the rows should actually be 2, and the columns should be 3. You get the same thing, but it's really rows minus, just to be a little bit clear. Row, there are two, 
there are two rows and three columns. This is a two by three table. Okay. Now, we sh here's the chi-square distribution. Notice that for so few degrees of freedom, it's really, really skewed. We get a chi-squared value of 6.68 with a p-value of about 3.5%. I want to spend a little bit of time showing where you would do this on the calculator. You first go to matrix. Yes, you enter the matrix. And usually we put the observed counts in matrix A. Now I know a lot of you haven't been to matrix before, but you can find it on your calculator. It's pretty obvious what you do. You go to a matrix, you want to edit the matrix, you say I want it to be a 2 by 3 matrix, and just enter in all the numbers. A matrix, you may remember from algebra 2, is just like a big grid of numbers, kind of like a little you know mini Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Then we go to chi-squared test on your calculator. You notice in section 14.1 we went to D. Now we're going to C. You use C for any chi-squared test involving a table. So that would be for both the test of independence like this one is and for the test of homogeneity. Then look how easy it is. You say, I want my observed counts to, are in A and then my expected counts are in B. Now I know you're saying, well, wait a second, I haven't entered in my expected counts yet. What you're basically saying is that's where you want the calculator to put them. You don't have to calculate those by hand. All you have to do is enter in the observed counts. The calculator will go crazy and calculate matrix B for you. So matrix B will be empty before you hit calculate. Then you hit calculate and you get this. Okay? And then afterwards, matrix B would look like this. It does all the math for you. Um, it calculates all the expected counts for you. And just to show you, here's a nice pretty picture of what chi-squared looks like. It calculates. This is, this is what happens when you go to calculate. This is what happens when you go to draw. Now the paragraph is pretty much the same thing. There is a 3.5% chance of getting the observed counts in the table. I'll just say that. By random chance, if your null hypothesis is true, which is age and opinion are independent. Since this is unlikely, in this case, I threw in less than alpha equals 0.05, just to make it clear that I'm making that as my threshold for unlikely. Because in theory, if my alpha value was 1%, this would have been likely. So I'm just making it clear in this kind of, you know, because 3.5% could either be considered likely or unlikely, I'm making it clear which way I'm doing it. So since this is unlikely, we'll reject the null hypothesis. There is evidence that whatever you wrote as your ha, age and opinion are related in some way. Similar paragraph to what we've seen before. This is the other example. I'm going to run through it pretty quickly, but I wanted just to mention that it's a test of homogeneity. This was the other example from the previous slide. Okay? It's a test of homogeneity again because the, the column totals in this case would all have been known ahead of time. Right? You knew you were asking 120 people. It's exactly the same thing as what we just did. There's no difference in steps 2, 3, and 4. The only difference is what we write in... Um, as your ho and your ha. So what we're going to say here is the proportions of symptoms are the same for all regions. Again, the homogeneity test means you're looking at many different populations. Our populations are northeast, midwest, southwest, and we took a sample from each of those populations. Compare that to a previous example really where our population was one big population of all people and then we categorize the entire population by either age and opinion. Okay. So here our ho is just a little bit different. The proportions of symptoms are the same for all regions. And then our ha, the proportions of symptoms are not the same for all regions. From now on, it's exactly like what we did before. The only difference between homogeneity and dependence is what you write in your ho and your ha. Okay? So I've been row totals and column totals. I went up here. I actually, here's what, the, here's what you get for your row totals and your column totals. Sorry, here's what you get for your expected counts. Excuse me using the formula row total times column total over table total. For example, this 28.75 comes from the row total, which is 115, column total is 120, over table total is 480, you get 28.75. And the conditions will assume actually all samples from each region, northeast, midwest, south, and west, are simple random samples. And then since all expected counts are bigger than 5, chi-squared is the appropriate thing to do. Now we go chi squared is observed minus expected squared over expected. Here's our expected counts. Here's our observed counts. So 26 minus 28.75 squared over 28.75. Here you would actually have to do that eight different times, right, for each cell in the table. Add them all up, you get a chi squared of 3.85. Okay. 
I did it wrong again too. Look, our degree, our degrees of freedom should be rows. So it should be two minus one, four minus one. Still three, but I was just it's rows minus one times columns minus one. I was actually kind of just doing it the other way, just to be consistent. Or I was, I was inconsistent. I'm going to show you it being consistent. So our chi-squared number adds up to 3.87. Here's the chi-squared curve. Again, a little bit um, degrees of freedom three, so still skewed, but not quite as skewed as the one where it's degrees of freedom two. We get chi squared 3.875. We shade here and get a p-value of about 27.5%. Okay. And again, just seeing it on the calculator, we go to matrix A. We have two rows, four columns. I enter those numbers in. Go to chi squared test. My observed are in May and going to be A. My observed are in A. My expected are going to be put in B. And in this case, I would have some numbers in B from the problem before. It'll just clobber those and put in the new expected counts. Here's our chi-squared test, calculates chi-squared, calculates the p-value, calculates degrees of freedom. Look, here's a nice pretty picture. Okay, and then if I go back to matrix B, matrix B now has these numbers in it. Those are my expected numbers, my expected counts. Oh no, something happened here. Can I move this at all? Let me see if I can move it. Maybe I can't. Well, I'll just read it. There's about a 27.5% chance of getting these observed counts by random chance if whatever your original hypothesis is true, which in this case is the symptoms proportions are the same for all regions. Since this is very likely, way more than 5%, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and there is not evidence that at least one region has a different proportion. Same paragraph as before. And that really wraps up section uh, chapter 14. We only have one more chapter to go. We're done with chapter 14, and now we're moving on to chapter 15, which is the last chapter we have to do. Hooray!